I'm really, God, I'm so bad at this. <laughs> I have not improved. All right, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk. I am Laughing Boy, and again, I'm here with... Chugga Conroy. Yay. Uh, on the last episode of Let's Talk, we started getting into the history of Chugga Conroy's channel, and we're going to keep going with that today. So, are you ready? Because you're not me yet, yes. <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> no, uh, if, if you find out that I am sick of you, it'll probably all just, like, the call will have hung up, I will have quit Skype, everything, I'll just destroy my entire workstation. That was a bad joke. Anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> speaking of jokes, your puns have become a frequent, have become more frequent as the channel has grown. So are you, are you typically a very punny guy? You can ask the people that know me, they will definitely attest to the fact that I am. Uh, there's times where they get a, I, they think I get a little bit too overbearing with it, especially if they're recording with me that day. <laughs> like, if I'm recording and I think of one that I think is good or horrible as it may be, I will say it out loud. But then we'll just be out someplace after recording and John will just be like, oh my god, Emil, shut up. You know the way that he says it in videos? He really says that in real life as well. That's not him putting on an act either. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. It, 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 my, uh, you know it's a good pun whenever people are just telling you, like, I will kill you or, oh my god, I will end you, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like you've ever had to hold back, um, especially earlier in your channel's history, on making any kind of puns? There are times where I think videos might get too dense with them, and if I was going to include them as cutaway gags, and they're just not really, I think, some of the better ones in the video, then I will leave them out, or some of the worst ones as it might be. Um, do you feel like uh, that... You felt like you couldn't make s puns, like, earlier in your channel's lifespan? Um, I don't know if I'd say that. I always made puns in some capacity. I just kind of grew more in a love of them over time. But <laughs> um, th there are times where there's puns that I can think of making that are about sensitive topics, and I just simply choose not to because they might be related to things in the real world, and I don't want to, you know, make light of a serious situation or anything. <laughs> Uh, on that note, have any of your puns gotten you in trouble? Uh, who, um, I've thought about this and I can't think of a specific example that wasn't in a video. Um, of course there are times where I get told to shut up in real life, but that's, I'd say right. about the extent of it. Okay. And, uh, so it might seem a little weird to toot your own horn, but which, what series of all your LPs do you consider your favorite? I can't really choose on that, because I feel like my experience with actually making it is very different from somebody who's on the outside watching it. Um, and there's also the fact that at this point I've made over 2,000 videos, and picking a set chunk of them that I would say are the best ones that I've made, it just kind of feels... It doesn't feel like something I can do, really. It's not that, oh, all my videos are so great, I can't tell which ones are the best. It's not that at all. It's just that it's it's similar to how artists are really critical on their own work and how they have a very different opinion of their own work from the people that experience what they make. That's valid. So that makes sense. There is that. I do know that series that a lot of people tell me are their favorites. There is Xenoblade Chronicles. There is um, there is Pokemon Platinum. There's um, there's Kid Icarus Uprising. Those are ones that people talk to me a lot. Animal Crossing New Leaf. Yeah, that was actually a really nice one. Like it was, it's kind of like a palate cleanser in a way. A palate cleanser. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. On the other side, was is there any series that you weren't as jazzed about? Um, there, are, sorry. Uh, I was just gonna kind of keep going until you said something. <laughs> okay. Um, there are a few experiences I've had that I think were less than positive with a series. Um, there was the fact that I came to realize while let's playing Pikmin Two that I actually prefer the original Pikmin more, even though I spent most of my life preferring Pikmin Two. It was just that Pikmin 2 was a game that I only got to play through once through renting it. And when I got older and actually was able to obtain a copy, because it was a rare game and it cost a lot of money, mm -hmm. I realized that I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I did. That it is a bigger game and it has a lot more enemies and a lot more areas to it. And it's a much longer game as well. And 
it has new types of Pikmin, and it's really cool in that way, and the graphics are really amazing for the time. I came to realize I just wasn't a big fan of the randomly generated dungeons quite so much, and, like, there was a time, I think, in the Let's Play, if, if not in the Let's Play, then when I was practicing for it, I got an unwinnable room where the exit was behind obstacles that I had no way of destroying with what was available to me anymore, and I thought that was really cruddy. Wow. Um, so I had that happen, uh, which I thought was kind of unfortunate. And then there was, um, there's a, I, I know some people disagree with me on this because I hear positivity about it. I'm not really too big of a fan of my Link's Awakening Let's Play. I think it kind of was bland and I didn't really like how the finale turned out personally. Really? Um, so I wouldn't really say that that's one of my better ones. Um, I did also kind of have a bit of a negative experience with Okamiden because there were a lot of people who didn't want to watch that series because it was a sequel to a very long game that not a lot of people bought and it was primarily story driven. So asking new viewers to watch that Let's Play, it would be asking them to either go and buy a really long game and play through it before they could watch this one or go on my channel and watch a like 90 part series on the original Okami before they could enjoy this one because it's a really story driven experience. And if the game immediately on the surface doesn't look like it's for you and not something that you're going to enjoy. And it's in that kind of a situation. It's not really something that you can give a chance and see if you like it. If it has that much prerequisite viewing before you can really get into it. Yeah. And I, I do feel like there are some people that actually like, uh, Okami fans that just do not like Okami Den. Yeah, I've I've kind of over time realized I don't like Okami Den as much as I thought I did when it was new. So there's also that, which I do think shows in the videos a little bit. I think it's an all right game though, but it's not at the same levels as the original. At least I don't think so today. Um, so there's 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 issues like that that come up from time to time. It, it did teach me a lot though because I do try to treat every series like it's its own thing, and I try to make it so that you don't have to know the series to enjoy the video. Um, for instance, with Xenoblade, I made sure to note that hey, you don't need to play Xeno Gear, Xeno Saga, or anything <laughs> like that to enjoy this. Um, so I, I I always try to make sure of that uh, that I'm not creating an experience that requires a ton of prerequisite viewing or requires being a fan of the game already. It's one of the most valuable things that I've learned from what was a negative experience at the time. Um, you just kind of made me think, have you played uh, the Z other Xeno games? I've played Xeno Gears, but not finished it. I play I've played Xenoblade X. I have access to the Xeno Saga games, but I haven't actually started on them yet. It's, it's weird. Mm -hmm. Xeno Saga, I know, was written to be six games, and only three of them ever actually got made, because four, five, and six were canceled. Mm -hmm. And from the outside looking in, I've heard the Xeno Saga games, the three that got made, were just pretty good or all right. And when you hear that, the fact that I'd be playing three pretty good to all right games that are the length of a Xeno game each... Yeah. And I would get to the end of the third game without a satisfying conclusion or knowing the entire story and the fact that I never will. It's not exactly making me want to jump in and play them, even though I'm sure they're all right games. Well, if it helps, they're all 80% cutscene. I guess, but <laughs> yeah, I've also heard that, that they're very long in the way of cutscenes, that you'll have hour-long cutscenes repeatedly. Um, One of the things that I've sort of noticed about the Xeno series as a whole is... uh. It seems that they're kind of doing things the right way with Blade, where the game's connectivity isn't obvious. Because mm -hmm. um, I feel like, because I think they did wanted the same effect with Xeno Gears that Xeno Saga was actually supposed to meld into Xeno Gears in some way or form, and it just never came to light because, like with Xeno Gears itself, they just kind of ran under budget and they just kind of had to slap dash something together in order to finish it. Yeah, Xeno, um, the Xeno series, like, it's kind of funny. People trying to relate the games and place them in a timeline and say which game is a sequel to which other game. It's kind of a mess in the fandom, and there's people that get annoyed when you so much as bring up that these two games must be related. Because it's a really weird topic in the fandom where some people really like trying to place a timeline of the Xeno games, but other people just find it, they're like, no, they said the games aren't related and they're not, like... You know, Xeno Blade is not taking place 500 years after Xeno Gears or anything like that. Like I, I've seen so many people mention that just in comments in general. Dang, where were we? Uh, 
Are there any projects that you've done that you would like to do over again? I've always wanted to do Reduxes of early series. I've I think it's an interesting idea, but I'm always wanting to do new things, so it would only happen if it were the thing that I wanted to do the most at the time, and there's just always been new things that I've wanted to do over doing Reduxes. Right, and um, obviously uh, asking the question for those listening in is not an admission of saying that this is definitely going to happen. So mm-hmm. so on that note, uh, we were talking about redoing games, but you've had a very firmly held belief about Let's Playing emulated games. Mm-hmm. Um, now, of course, Earthbound Zero and Mother 3 are two series on your channel that um, were exceptions were made due to their uh, circumstances. Yeah, it had to be done. There was no other way to play those games in English. Uh, so again, not admis- admitting that something is going to happen, uh, now that Earthbound Beginnings has been released, do you see a remake of that game in your future? I don't want to confirm or deny anything at all about upcoming projects. I will say that, personally, I don't think Earthbound Beginnings is that great of a game. I like it a fair amount, and it was the birthplace of a lot of really great songs and some good ideas in the series. But it's just so grind-heavy, so random, there's so many one-hit kill moves everywhere. It's kind of unfair, and it's not based so much on skill and strategy as it is how many hours you spend grinding up your level 1 party members when they join you. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I would say that I'm not going to confirm or deny anything, but it's not the one that I would immediately think of when wanting to redo something just because I don't think it's that spectacular of a game. And that's valid. I, I would agree with that. Um, obviously, you don't want to do something just because you feel like you have to. Yeah. Um. Let's see. So were there any projects that you maybe wanted to do, but they just never really made the cut? There were some. Uh, in the early days of the channel, one of the early ideas for a Let's Play that I had was doing one of Yoshi's Island. I didn't ever come to do that because, for one, I tried talking over the game to myself just to see if I could focus on talking and playing it at the same time. And I felt like I was struggling to talk about much of anything that was of substance when I was playing it. This was many years ago, so things can change, of course. Mm-hmm. Um and there was also the fact that back then YouTube had a 10 minute time limit and levels in Yoshi's Island, if you're getting 100%, can go on for a very long time. <sighs> so I thought it was a poor idea. Yeah, and um, uh, for some reason, I've always noticed that Yoshi and Kirby games seem to follow the same logic where they start off very short, very simple. And then pretty much by the time you get to the maybe the last, the sixth world or what what have you. Uh, it sort of becomes like this master class of, well, I hope you learned everything from Worlds 1 through 5. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, the levels do become like obscenely long. If you want to get 100% in every level in Yoshi's Story, it's br- or Yoshi's Island, it's brutal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think Proton John can attest to that. Yeah, he seemed to not really be enjoying the game as much in the later worlds. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean... And, and on that note, like, I, I could not get myself to even try 100% in Island DS. Oh, man. That was... That game actually made me very upset for a Yoshi game. <laughs> well, the, the weird thing about Yoshi is that Yoshi's Island and Yoshi's Willy World seem to be the only two games that are universally loved. Despite Yoshi being such a beloved character, I've always noticed that it's not so much for his own games as it is Mario's games and for spinoffs and things like that. Yeah, and I think at least in um I almost just said Yarn Yoshi, in Woolly World's case, that's like Good Feel has has made um some pretty solid games. I th- I personally think Good Feel is one of the best studios at Nintendo present day. Yeah. Um I would probably say one of it uh, personally. Yeah. Um it, I Going through it, I'm not a huge fan of Wario Land Shake It, mm-hmm. but uh, I cut, but I was raised off of Wario Land Four, which is like the goofy game, and then I think I feel like Shake Come It on. sort of turned down uh, a lot of that goofiness from Wario Land Four. Come on, work it, work <laughs> it! <laughs> Hurry up! Those lyrics, like, they're so nonsensical. It was kind of impressive that they had lyrics in a Game Boy Advance game, but it was impossible to understand. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, it was just, there was like, feel free to like bleep this out if you like need to, but there was, uh, I remember that there was a thread, the, uh, or rather um, on the game facts board for Wario Land 4 back when it was new. Every other thread created on that board was about the game's intro and asking, did she seriously say fuck yeah and this game is E-rated? <laughs> Oh, man. I remember I saw that just so often that people were asking if she seriously said that in an E-rated game. <laughs> and everyone else just like, I, I don't know. It, it kind of sounds like it. So were there any other projects? Um, Very briefly, I thought of Let's Playing Eternal Sonata because it's an RPG that I really like. But it's a pretty good one. It is good. I just haven't really ever furthered the idea. Um. Again, I don't ever want to confirm or deny anything because things can change. And there is also the fact that, of course, there are things I'm working on right now. Moving on, what was your favorite moment in your entire LP career? Honestly, just honestly, just getting to see what kinds of people the viewers are at conventions and being able to go out there and do that. I, I get people that online that do complain sometimes being like, oh, come on, you're not updating because you're going to a convention. You know, you should stop going to so many. But... I, it's a very enjoyable part of the experience and one that I feel is I feel is very a very important thing to do is to go to these things so you can see what kinds of people the viewers are and maybe find out who the person behind this username is that you've seen all this time and I feel like it's another layer of things that is something I wouldn't give up for the world. So moving on, uh you know, getting sick is a part of life, and it could cause some minor disruptions to someone with a daily upload schedule like yours. Uh, but back in, I think, 2014, you came down with something that caused you to stop uploading videos for, like, two months. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened? It was that I had gone to Comic-Con to do a Throne Controller show. On the second day of this trip, my ear started hurting. And after coming home, it would just not stop hurting. It was getting worse. I was thirsty all the time. I went to, through some bad luck, this hit on, um, I was switching insurance companies at the time. And this hit on the second day out of 16 that I was going to be uninsured during the switch. Wow. So because it wasn't getting better, I had to go to the ER, pay out of pocket, and I didn't have a primary care physician that I could go see about this. Mm. Um, I got some bad medical advice from the ER doctor that I saw, which led to it becoming worse. It was that I had an ear infection that was able to get so bad that it became an upper respiratory infection. Oh, wow. And I just felt drained of my energy all the time. I was sleeping like 16 hours a day. It... By the time I could get good medical help on this whole thing, I was ha I had to be put on really powerful antibiotics that I had to take steroids to cancel them out so that I wouldn't feel like I was dying. <laughs> Jesus. So I had to do that, and it was just a combination of a lot of really bad things hitting at the same time and the illness being made worse through some bad medical advice. That sounds awful. Yeah, so that was what happened. Um, it was that I don't know how this happened though, but it was that the doctor that I saw thought that I had a bacterial infection when it was actually a viral infection. So the things they prescribed to me weren't helping. And because I was going longer and longer without treatment, infections grow. Of course. So that was, As what was is their want that was going on. Um, when I finally found some good medical advice, yeah, I, I spent about two months recovering, but I got there. Uh, so how did you feel with the inability to keep uploading or do videos? I'll admit that I had a very short temper and I was frequently very angry feeling. I'm willing to bet it was probably the medicine talking more than me. Yeah, probably. Because <laughs> I did feel really bad about just how I'd been after that point. But yeah, it was it was overall a very unpleasant experience that I'm hoping I won't have to go through again. It was definitely the sickest I had ever been in my life, though, because I... I've been lucky. I've never broken a bone. I've never had an allergic reaction to anything. Um, it was the first time where I had to spend any lengthy period of time in a hospital, even. Oh, wow. So I was very lucky in that way. And after going through things like that and even having to get procedures done with it, because... Um, I had some things about my, um, from taking strong medicine for that long, I had some digestive issues 
and I had to have a procedure done to fix that after the fact. So I was still recovering from this even after the infection was gone. Yeah. As somebody who went through a procedure and went through strong medicine and having to take steroids to cancel it out, I have the utmost respect for people that spend a lot of time in the hospital and make it through much more serious illnesses because I can tell you that just doing that for two months was really, really difficult. And I have the utmost respect for people who come out on the other side of much longer ordeals with really serious ailments. Yeah, that uh, definitely. I, I can't even imagine, like begin to imagine how something like that would be, even if, even for two months. Yeah. I've, I've known people that they've had to have series of surgeries done over the course of years where they need to have something replaced, but they can only replace it in sections without it being so it's not too invasive so they have to have say one sixteenth of this thing replaced then they spend three weeks in recovery and then once they recover they're back in for more surgery and then they just do this 16 times until the entire thing is replaced <sighs> so yeah i have the utmost respect for those people and it was a really eye-opening experience to that yeah i can imagine well imagine as much as i can mm -hmm. um Two months, uh, that's a long time. Do you, were you worried at all about how this might impact your channel? I'll admit that was a really big worry because YouTube, a lot of people say YouTube doesn't give sick days. And if you don't update for a long period of time, there are people that lose interest. Um, I think I was very fortunate in that upon coming back, there wasn't a big loss of interest. And a lot of people just wanted to see Xenoblade continue. Yeah. Um... So I can definitely thank my viewers for that, for there not being a huge decrease in interest. Because I thought when I came back, I was going to come back and I'd be getting half the day one views that I was back before that happened. But it luckily wasn't the case. Is there any sort of thing that you would want to say about like this time in your life? Maybe a message to fans or friends? Uh, I think I said it, I said it all that I could. Um, okay. Just really thank you for everything that was said and everything that... Uh, how everything was able to continue as it was when I got back. Um, views certainly aren't the only concern that I have when making videos because I've historically always done what I want and what I think is best. But it certainly was a worry that coming back from that, that there just simply wouldn't be that same interest that there was in the Xenoblade videos when I started doing them. Because I knew we still had a long ways to go. So... For a new subscriber, learning a bunch of in-jokes, catchphrases, and background information on the LP or they follow... Happy your topic. <laughs> uh, no, it, I, I couldn't really come up with a follow-up, so I'm just like, um, hmm. Because uh, it's either... I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't criticizing. I'm happy to move on to happier topics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, there we go. Uh, so, especially for someone who's been LPing for a long time, uh, you may have a lot of series already on your channel. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any LP series that you would recommend to a new subscriber in order to feel caught up? Um, Not really, because I feel like a lot of my in-jokes began in the early days, and I don't think those are videos that have aged very well, if I may be <laughs> honest. Um, and on top of that, they, you know, again, things at the very beginning were different. Um. So I, I don't really want to say, you know, oh, go check out this Let's Play and watch this one first and all those things. Just if there's something you like, something that you're enthusiastic about, something that you wanted to know more about, maybe you can, you know, I, I'm sure that making that decision is, you know, just whatever you're into. Okay. And um, speaking of, like, catchphrases and jokes, you do have a couple that are still referenced or even used today. Mm -hmm. So we can go over at least a couple of these real quick and maybe explain their origins so people who may not understand them will feel a little bit up to speed. Okay. Uh, the first one, uh, it is almost 10 o'clock at night, so I don't really want to yell. Uh, but do you know the one I'm talking about? The no! <laughs> there it is. Yes. Um, okay. That was a bit of an accidental success because um, the epic no is not my creation. Um, it's from the old Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon, the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, it was a thing that was quoted a lot on the internet back in general at the time, and I guess I was just kind of the one that people liked saying it at the time. Good old um, YouTube poops. Yeah, it was that. There's an episode where 
Robotnik is going to fly a plane that Scratch and Grounder have built for him. And Scratch and Grounder are super, super excited to fly the plane with him and everything and, you know, be able to fly in a plane. And Robotnik (laughs) is furious that they think that they're going to be on this plane with him. And he just looks furious at them. And Scratch is just like, we get to go too, right? And he's just like, no, into their face. (laughs) And then just takes off without them. Yeah. It was something like that, and it just, it sounds really funny, and I thought that quoting that when saying, like, no to people in RPGs to be really rude, because there's times where people are like, hey, you know, you like me, you want me to come along with you on your journey, right? Just shouting no in their face. (laughs) It it was just, I thought it was a funny way to say something really rude, and I guess it just kind of caught on like that. But thou must. (laughs) Uh, The other one... uh is a particularly particular favorite of mine because I feel like it's defined some of your runaway guy legacy. Uh-huh. But uh doing Daisy on hard. Oh my god. No. <laughs> that was that was just me talking casually <laughs> when we were selecting a character in Mario Party 6 on a stream. <laughs> uh and you've never lived it down. I have never lived it. And I just kept saying more and more dumb stuff throughout the night in my naivety. It was it was a pretty good stream video. Yeah, John, I, I think John at one point said it was his favorite stream that he'd done. So <laughs> I guess there's at least that. At least he enjoys it that much. Um, Speaking of things you cannot li- seem to live down, uh, let's talk a little bit about Steve. Oh, boy. <laughs> So who is Steve? Steve is that one red leaf Pikmin that is in every squadron that trips and falls and in general just makes mistakes whenever you issue very clear commands because Pikmin AI is stupid. <laughs> so why is this Steve so famous amongst your fans? It's just the there was um well, I guess I don't want to spoil the video of when something happened though, but there was a time where Steve really proved himself and just was it was that he'd been messing up a lot and i'd been pointing it out every time he did and then there was a time where he incredibly proved himself in a tight spot (laughs) um so that wound up happening i tried not to over rely on the joke i tried to like let it die with pikmin one um (laughs) because that was the joke that was that was the joke of that let's play i think that was what my intention was and that's why i didn't acknowledge it in pikmin 2 because i felt like the joke had kind of run its course and i didn't want to over rely on old jokes on your series because again i do try to make each series stand in its own and you know not be something you'd need to watch an earlier series to really enjoy uh in pikmin 3 i did i wouldn't say i brought the joke back but i do talk for a little bit toward the beginning of the game about just what the experience was of having that whole thing take off like it did and I do mention it, though, because the way the first level of Pikmin 3 is designed, it's just they give you one extra red leaf Pikmin than what you need, and it just makes all the animations so awkward. <laughs> so it was it was something that I couldn't have avoided. I, I think at that point, because it had been years since I had relied on that joke, that I could kind of bring it back for that one video and talk about it a little bit, but <laughs> that was really all I was going to do. Uh, so kind of to that point, how do you feel about I guess, the legacy of Steve. The legacy of Steve coming this fall on Fox. No. Um, I I thought it was a funny thing when it happened, and I was excited to post it when it did. It did grow kind of beyond my control, which, if people are having fun with it, that's great. I have nothing against that, but my biggest worry was just over-relying on the joke and making it you know, more of a bad thing than a good thing whenever it happened to rear its head again. (laughs) I I try to only bring it up when I feel it's really applicable. Uh, Like, there's a moment in Pokemon Emerald where I mentioned it briefly, and I felt like it was applicable there, so I always try to not do that. I do definitely do overuse jokes. I I mean, I ran Doe I Missed into the ground, I'll be perfectly honest with you, but it's something that I do try to at least try to not do too much. I mean, for quotes, it's so hard not to do that, though. Because, like, Doe I Missed is so usable. You can say it anytime you miss it in an RPG or anytime something doesn't go your way. And Well, like, thinking about, especially N64 games, like, if anybody's a fan of Star Fox 64, I quote that thing to death. 
the quotes are what made Star Fox 64 what it was. And I think that's going to wrap it up for today's episode. I think we've learned about as much as we could um, about the background of your channel. Mm -hmm. So I think next time we're going to go into how to do Let's Plays and uh, everything. Like how do you prepare for them? How do you create them? And just all all sorts of neat stuff. I, I'm actually really looking forward to this part. Mm -hmm. So, But until then, we will see you guys next time. We're going to take a quick break. Um, Bye. Bye. <laughs>